Delighted to welcome Delegate Danica Rome and Delegate Dolores McQuinn for this week in Virginia. The special session is practically over. We're just waiting for the governor to sign the budget a little later. And as our viewers know, this was a budget session. It was criminal justice and social justice issues, but it also had an education bill that came out of the House of Delegates, went through the Senate, passed unanimously in both chambers, that has to do with a very important subject. And that's why I have the two experts on to talk about it. Delegate Rome from Prince William, who was the chief patron. Delegate McQuinn was one of the chief co-patrons, along with Delegate Price, Delegate Hope. I believe they were the other, other two. And when, you, when someone looks at the bill, House Bill, Five, five, one, one, three. Do I have the numbers right? Yes. Uh, they look at they look at the bill. They see something about community eligibility provision, and they might not know what that means. And Delegate Rome, you start, and then Delegate McQueen join in. Tell our viewers, tell our viewers what this bill does. Absolutely. Well, first, thank you so much, David, for having me on. And it's so wonderful to see my uh, colleague, uh, Delegate McCoy, here as well. Um, so what CEP is, the Community Eligibility Provision, this is part of a, of a national school meals program that is administrated by the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, so the USDA. And basically what it does is that in schools where you have at least 40% of the students, the identified student percentage, um, already enrolled in free and reduced meals as it is, that this basically makes free meals eligible for everyone who goes to that school. And this is important because for a number of reasons. The first part of this is, this is a federally funded program. And so right. for my uh, appropriations committee colleague, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Delia McQuinn, one of the important reasons that I really was happy that she signed on as a chief co-patron on this is because for her as a member of the Appropriations Committee to basically give her stamp of approval for this from the get-go, the fact that there's no fiscal impact to the state and that we had the support of committee members on there, that allowed the very folks who were gonna be vetting this bill since you know the Education Committee wasn't gonna meet to basically know that we were in really good shape right from the outside. And one of the other things is Delia McQuinn has spent her whole career working on food security and tackling food injustice areas, dealing with food deserts, for example. These are, she has an extensive history in terms of making sure that we actually have equitable, equitable access to, you know, to meals. And for a bill like this in Prince William County, where I represent, for example, where about 12 to 15 schools are gonna qualify, almost all, if not all of them, are in largely black and brown communities. And School meals in Northern Virginia in particular are disproportionately needed by black and brown communities. And the reason for that basically being that if you are in, in an area that is already experiencing high levels of poverty, high levels of, you know, basically I, what I would basically call, you know, not having enough income in general, that if you need that assistance, being able to not only have a reduced meal, but the free meal in this case, this is gonna create stability within your family. This allows you to know that when your children go to school, they get fed breakfast and lunch, full nutritional value, no questions asked. And because we passed my bill earlier this year to ban alternative meals from being served, you know that when your babies are at school, they're being taken care of, and that they're not coming home hungry. And we even passed one of my bills this year that allows the distribution of excess school meals at the end of the day. And so the part of this bill that we really had to workshop a lot um, going into committee was basically saying that, look, for the overwhelming majority of schools that would participate, they would be foolish not to. In the city of Richmond, for example, they are entirely enrolled in the community eligibility provision. And as Delia McQuinn would be able to tell you, the fact that they don't have the administrative burden of tracking down who qualifies, who doesn't, who's turned in paperwork, who hasn't, that's alleviated a burden both for the city as well as for parents to not fall into school meal debt in the first place. And by the way, school meal debt shouldn't be a concept that actually exists. That shouldn't be a thing. Your kids should just get fed and no questions asked. Uh, and so I would just say, leave it to an Italian stepmom. I will always do everything I can to feed children and you know, super proud that this bill is going to guarantee free school meals to up to 109,000 more Virginia students at 180 different schools. This is a great deal. 
It, it, it is great. Delegate McQuinn, uh, say, say some more. And, and in addition to okay, being I will, from I will, Richmond, and I yeah. probably And I probably, David, just sort of take it in a, a, a different direction. But I wanted to certainly thank you for highlighting this particular issue and always being on the front line of helping to address some of those social issues and making sure that people are aware of what's going on. I certainly want to thank Delegate Rome and the fact that I uh, that she allowed me to be a chief co-patron with her on this. As you know, uh, and, and, and Delegate Rome has certainly uh, spoke to that, alluded to that, that the issue of food insecurity has been a part of my platform as long as I can remember. Coming from when I served on city council in, for the city of Richmond and looking at the issues of poverty in the community, poverty in the school district. And so this uh, fit right in line with what I have been doing. And so I really want to just commend her for her efforts. What, what, what we all both realize, and many of us do, that you know uh, these high poverty areas that we often need something in addition to what is already there to help support those communities. And food certainly is one of those things. When, when you look at a child who, um, who's going to school to learn, what I am is certain that we understand that a hungry child, it is different for them, for them, difficult for them to concentrate on learning when their stomach is growling. And even those of us who are adults who have access to food, if we know when we are hungry, there is that biological uh, part of us that speaks to that. And we know before we can really get a lot of things done, we need to have it addressed. So when you look at the CEP and how it is helping to address the highest poverty schools in the district, and there were some who weren't participating. As, as uh, Delegate Rome has said that certainly the city of Richmond was fully engaged, uh, but there are so many more individuals across this Commonwealth and children that need that additional support in terms of the educational system. The whole child, the need of the entire child must be met. And this brings us to a part of meeting that child's need where we can guarantee that this child will not go hungry, parents are happy about it, and the child is happy once their belly is full. Now, one thing that has been interesting, and, and, and um, Delegate Roman, I've not had a chance to talk about this, but COVID-19 has now made everyone, it's almost the, 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 the equalizer here, because in this Commonwealth, you know, I have uh, participated in how when we shut down schools and how are we going to help meet the needs of those kids who are hungry? But it is the lines are longer, more kids are, don't have access to food or parents for that matter. And so I think that this program was certainly has come about at the right time, uh, but not only the right time, with the right uh, 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 tools um, to provide what is needed for the many, many thousands of Virginians who are finding themselves in a situation that we had no clue they would be in uh, when we had session, 2020 session. So this came at a perfect time. And again, I want to thank Delegate Rome for, for her, um, just her, her, her progressive way of addressing some of the issues that we're dealing with. And, and I really wanna, again, compliment and thank each of you for your leadership, uh, leadership not just in this special session, but but throughout the years and in addressing these important issues. And uh, one thing that I, I'm sure that most of our viewers understand, but let me speak to it and then Delegate Rome, you might add some more. I think one of the great things about it is if my child, or I should say now my grandchild, if my grandchild is one who who would qualify for that, but your grandchild or your child is not one who does, they're treated equally. There's no, there's no stigma attached to where, where my grandchild is getting free food and someone else is not. And they say, oh, you got someone unemployed or are you poor or whatever you might say. Delegate Rome, speak to that some more. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So one of the things I'm actually really happy about uh, that we just voted on in the budget that, you know, uh, Delegate McQuinn helped craft here 
was we actually have more money in the budget this year to transform reduced price meals into free meals, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even though that doesn't have an immediate pressing need up front because of the USDA's you know, summer meals program waiver being extended, we are going to have that issue throughout the FY20 uh, to 2022 uh, biennium. And so when we are dealing with, you know, basically equity within the system here, we do want to make sure that kids are not being singled out and stigmatized just because they come from poor families. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that when you go up and you pick up your meal, that basically it's already guaranteed. And I'll be just as blunt and honest with you as, as can be. My ultimate goal is universal free school meals. To yeah. me, it should be an essential service that is part of the social contract that's provided to families no matter where you are. Right now, we have universal bus transportation, for example, right? Right now, we have universal hand soap, toilet paper, sink, electricity within the school, t you know, teacher salaries, all of this sort of stuff. It is not based on, okay, well, this family makes a certain amount of money, so they can pay a certain amount of uh, this water bill, but this one is... A it's just when you go to school, you go to school and you have all the same services and essential you know, things provided for you, right? And one of the other things I wanna mention here is that especially in the age of COVID right now, this bill came as a result of the COVID work study group that uh, Secretary um, Otto Carney from the Department of Education actually put together as a recommendation for mandating participation in the community eligibility provision in the first place. What we've essentially done is we've transformed it from an opt-in program to opt-out wow. now. And this will basically accelerate that enrollment for so many of these schools that have either been dragging their feet, they don't fully understand CEP, they are newly eligible for CEP, or they've had a lot of questions and they just haven't gotten around to, you know, basically trying to find the answers for those yet. What you're going to see very quickly, basically once this bill goes into effect um, in 2021 and then uh, in the subsequent months, is that you're going to start seeing a lot of enrollment as localities and specifically as schools begin to realize the amount of savings that they can have and the real good benefit of this program here, which is basically making sure that you have fewer costs at the school level, you have fewer costs for parents, and you don't have to worry about who's paying, who's not, who's got this, who's not. Everyone just eats and has a nice day. That's it. One more, what again? Italian step mom, what more could I want than to make sure that you're fed? Go eat. <laughs> and the opt, out, the opt out provision too. And you mentioned 180 schools. I would hope there would not be any that would seek that waiver. But if they do, I hope they're on some list that's publicly available. Well, I, what, what, well, well, David, I think it's going to be a little hard pressed for anyone to seek a waiver right now. I, I just believe based on where we are again, and what uh, Delegate Rome has been doing in terms of bringing us to this place. I mean, it's been a lot of discussion in the past session and special session on this. And I think that we are on a pathway to people understanding again, how, the, uh, how imperative it is for us to make certain that children in, in all people basically, but especially young people in schools are fed. We talk about a free education, but yet there are so many stipulations over the years that have been costly to parents. This again, takes away that cost, even to purchase groceries and then provide groceries during the week for your children to eat uh, while they're at school. But, but this now puts all, everyone in a different posture. And so, I would think it would be ludicrous for any school district to opt out of this with the understanding that, that, it, that they are eligible and you now have a way of making certain that you're providing something for every child. And so that takes some, this off the table, hunger off the table, food insecurity off the table. You're providing them something that is needed and just for their very existence. Um, and, and so then teachers, educators can get to the next thing in terms of providing young people what they need, and that is their education. You know, I think if there's any school that's thinking about seeking a waiver, they should first talk with the two of you. <laughs> I, th I think that after, after they hear the, the, 
the clear message and the passion that you have for school children, they would not be so eager to seek a, seek a waiver. Unless there's something else you want to tell us about that bill, I mentioned to both of you that we'd have a few more minutes. And if there's something that you'd like to talk about, even as it relates, yes, Delegate Rome? Yeah, sure. So actually, one of the things I do want to mention here is that this bill also came after I personally had to wage a number of fights with, with successful fights with the USDA this year. <laughs> I, I really want people to understand with this that we have had a very complicated relationship with the USDA throughout 2020 right now. Mm. And that this is one of the programs that the USDA has that is actually good, that no matter who's going to be in charge doing whatever, this program has been around for a number of years now that opting into our, you know, basically signing up for it now, you know, mandatory signing up for it now, if you're eligible, that you are locking yourself in for four years of guaranteed free meals for your kids. Wow. That, that's number one, that's huge. The second part on this, back in March, when the shutdowns were beginning, the USDA was requiring parents to have to bring their children, including their immunocompromised children, it's such as a seven-year-old who, who lives in Gainesville, who's one of my constituents, her mother was supposed to bring her baby with her in order to go and pick up these uh, school meals when they were supposed to be sheltering in place. This girl is recovering from cancer, mm. cancer. Mm. And she cried to her mother, Ma, I don't want to get COVID. I don't want to get COVID. I don't want to get coronavirus. And I literally drove to her house to drop off groceries and to, and with one of my constituents, Adele Settle, we literally just gave her hundreds of dollars to you know, take care of her family. And this is someone who lives in a nice single family house, cul-de-sac, as you know, nice of a community as you imagine. Hunger and food insecurity is right before our very eyes and we don't even see it so often. Mm -hmm. So often we will just simply stereotype people based on the neighborhood that they live in, based on X, Y, or Z, without realizing that food insecurity is so pervasive. And there's another family of eight kids over in Bristow, along with uh, two parents, and three of their children have severe uh, disabilities that they have to deal with. So... I dropped off groceries over to their family one day, for example, and the day that we actually won our first fight with the USDA, I had literally just dropped off a, a couple, like, Jesus, like an entire trunk load of uh, groceries that I got from Safeway. So I dropped them off over in Bristow. I come home and late that night, uh, one of our local school board members drops me a line and says like, hey, Danica, I think we got the waiver. And what the waiver did was basically said, parents no longer have to bring their children with them in order to pick up these meals. Mm -hmm. And that's so important because now it's just, the it's done differently, basically like school district by school district. But what you'll have is that you just make sure that you actually have kids you know, who are under 18 and you get, you get them fed. And there were people who would argue on this like, well, won't there be fraud? If you're willing to wait for two hours in line so that you can get a kid's meal to take home, well, you know what? Let's err on the side of feeding children. Right. Because exactly. we're not going to have a fight about a non-existent problem. And if it does exist, it's not even statistically significant enough for us to, to care about it. And frankly, if you need the food that badly, well, God bless you. Here's some food. <laughs> and David, I don't have much to add to that. Uh, but but I do, you know, as I just think about any of those, these uh, bills that or legislation that deals with the issue of food and food access, uh, you know, it was just a, a little gentleman, I think I've told you this story before, that was in my neighborhood, where every other day was knocking on the door, asking for food for himself and his siblings. And that has stuck with me for many, many years. This was in the early 90s. And I will continue to help address this, whether child or adult. I just think it's imperative that as a nation, as I often say, as powerful, as rich as we are as a nation and a commonwealth, uh, that uh, something um, to me as simple as feeding, making sure people are fed ought to be a easy road to take. And so this just helps us uh, in terms of that roadmap to making sure that we are knocking down hunger's door. Well, any any uh, little 
teaser about some upcoming legislation that either of you are going to be introducing. It's, it's amazing that January 13th, that seemed in some way so far away, is not. It's close. It, it uh, is. So uh, I have an entire, what we call the idea bank that my team and I are, are sifting through right now. I will tell you, for the fourth year in a row, I will be bringing back my bill to require health insurers to have to cover mechanical prosthetic devices. If I, and I will be bringing back my FOIA ombudsman bill so that we have a state level uh, Freedom of Information Act you know, ombudsman. And I've got a lot of other ideas right now too that I gotta condense into 15 or so. Um, and so, you know what? You know what Hillary Clinton told me personally once? I, I asked her for her advice as a Senator uh, you know, this is even after 2016 election. I said, just in your experience as a senator, what do I need to know to be a good legislator? What, what should I know? And she said, never give up on a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I am still uh, researching and working on a couple of things. I know that I will be bringing back some of the bills that I had, um, um, had patroned before, um, but uh, I, don't, I don't have anything nailed down yet. So I'm still researching. Well, I thank you both. Before we end, I want to give a shout out to Blue Ridge PBS out in Roanoke because this show will be seen throughout their system. And, all, and also Chesapeake Public Schools contacted me and said, we want to be picking up these shows. So they're going to be some students and teachers and family members in Chesapeake that will be seeing you all and saying, oh, do we have some of those 180 schools in Chesapeake? They probably do. Well, so. uh, David, uh, Delegate Hayes is my committee chairman on CTI, so I have to say Chesapeake is fantastic. What a great yes. system. Yes, <laughs> right. he's, one of, he's one of the greatest. Yes, <laughs> yes. But David, well, again, thank you. Thank you thank for you. all that you do. Again, thank you for allowing us this opportunity and just for the work that you do, making sure that these social issues are heard, that uh, they are highlighted, and people have a good sense of what's going on in the Commonwealth as it relates to those who represent them. So thank you again. Second it all, right. all around. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Dahlia. Thank okay. you. Thank and you. We'll look, look forward to talking to you again.